So if our universe is a computer simulation, who or what created the simulation? In 2007, at a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, I met Jerry and Kathy Wills, who have been leading expeditions to what Aymara natives of Peru and Bolivia call Oramamuru, or Puerta do Hayumarca, which means doorway to the lands of the gods and immortal life. The doorway of Aramamuru is about halfway between the Yave district to the northwest and Huli to the southeast. Local Aymara natives in Peru and Bolivia revere the mysterious ancient carved rock door and say it is where life was first created on Earth. The solid rock doorway is said to lead to another dimension, and they have a word for it, and it is dimension. Many Peruvians and Bolivians are afraid to be near the Aramamuru doorway because locals claim that some people have appeared coming through the solid rock door and then later disappeared going back into the rock door. Some even say that they have seen strange, very tall men with glowing balls of light walk out of the solid rock door. Remember, it isn't a door that swings on hinges. It is the rectangle of a door. And just to orient you, because it's very interesting, this is 23 feet here to where this man is standing. This has been measured. I don't have the final, but it's about uh, Jerry Will says he thinks it's six foot three to six foot six. Now he's six foot nine. He had to get down. So I think his estimate of six foot th three to six is probably pretty close. This is a man that uh, had been in there when this photographer took this photo, not Jerry, but it's showing. And the reason why I'm taking some time. This is where the shamans, for really centuries is a fair word, this is what they refer to as the Aramamuru. And this is the bigger door. And nobody, not in mythology, not in villages passing, nobody knows how or why the 23-foot door was carved around this door. And the natives who have seen people come through this rock have seen them always coming through the six to six and a half foot tall door. And they have seen them appear coming through with a flash of light or going into the rock with a flash of light. And then if they're coming out, they look like they are in ancient Inca dress, as if something is mimicking something from long, long ago. Now here is Jerry. It, he's not in the doorway, but you can tell he is a tall, lanky man. And on November 11th, 1998, at 11 p.m. in the evening, Jerry and his wife, Kathy, were newlyweds, and Jerry was at the solid rock Aramamura doorway because he had been trying to understand his own strange life and strange places that he was attracted to, specifically in Peru. His whole life he's been attracted to Peru. Jerry was born an orphan in 1953, and he was left to die alone in a cold Kentucky farmhouse. And miraculously, he was rescued by people who stumbled into this farmhouse and was adopted by a Kentucky family who had a farm. In 1965, at age 12 and a half, on a cold fall day, Jerry was stacking wood at sundown when a silver aerial disc appeared over some tall pine trees Large, pale lights pulsed one after the other around the UFO, going in one direction and then reversing in a slow, steady pulse. 
There was no wind, but the tops of the pine trees whipped back and forth as if the silver UFO was emitting some kind of energy, and we've all heard that. It can be a completely still day, and a disc comes treetop, and the trees are doing this. In his mind, Jerry Wills heard a telepathic thought voice from whoever was in the silver craft saying that these unseen visitors would return to meet Jerry again in the future. A year later, in July 1966, Jerry was face to face with a tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, extraterrestrial male named Zoe. Zoe said he was from a humanoid civilization on a planet orbiting the star Tau Ceti, about 12, 12 light years from Earth. Here's us, here's Tau Ceti, 12 light years. You hear a lot about Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, Betty and Barney Hill. And some of these others are coming up, the Gleazy stars are coming up in the NASA lists of uh, suns that may have habitable planets. So we, we're dealing with a neighborhood here. And interestingly enough, most of the suns, I made these yellow just so they would stand out. Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, all of these are pretty, most of them are pretty, about 19 are in a yellow sun sequence, sort of similar to our own sun. Now, Jerry has, in 1966, a whole series of this kind of consciousness, beta consciousness, with the blonde, with beautiful aquamarine eyes, uh, skin that was uh, beigey brown, uh, usually always wearing a jumpsuit. And Jerry, with his strange life, starting out as an orphan, never feeling quite connected to much of anything, he starts feeling like this Zoe is, is really a good friend. And he said that Zoe would put him in this craft. He had these big hands, and his hands didn't exactly fit. But Zoe would show him how these weren't six-fingered, and they weren't four-fingered. They were five-fingered panels. This is a six-fingered panel from the Roswell region. Um, the idea being, in all these cases, that there is hand, mind, craft. Craft, think of as being organic and reactive in its own self-activating software. You put the fingers inside of the panel that then connects your mind to the craft that is a sentient being and that that's how they fly. And that Jerry had this experience and found that he could do this. Now, this, these particular panels, for people who have heard that it was all a hoax and Ray Santilli in London hoaxed it all, I mean, that's counterintelligence at work. We know how that works. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've seen the original interview with the original cameraman who was there in the tents, who took the photographs, all of this stuff uh, back a few years ago when I think uh, uh, Ray Santilli, I think, was here, or somebody was here with his film. But this was a site, just so you'll know, that between Aragon and Elk Mountain, at the western end of the Plains of San Augustine, that's where these panels were found, if you have not heard. But these were six-fingered, six-toed entities. These were autopsied at either Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, or the Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and the man that I called uh, Stein uh, in myearthfiles.com news, and then uh, later he was uh, identified as anonymous at the citizens' hearing in 2013. Uh, back in 1998, I spent three days at his place and audio taped him. Uh, so that's where it started, the connection with who you may have known as Anonymous, and I know him by a completely other name, and was with his wife and his son. And he told me that working in 1956 to 60, 
he had uh, worked for the CIA, that's where his uh, real paycheck came, but that it, was, uh, it came through teaching cryptoanalysis in a base in the southeastern United States where the Army had a cover for the CIA in uh, investigations of UFOs, ETs, and his boss was Langley, CIA, Washington, D.C. The extraterrestrial from Tau Ceti also showed Jerry Wills a four-foot black cube that holographically projected the Milky Way galaxy and other parts of the universe that showed different stars in different colors. As Zoe pointed out star systems, he telepathically told Jerry that people, homo sapien, or at least humanoid types on Earth, did not originate on this planet, which you are beginning to hear in other sources, such as Tom DeLonge and other places where we're being introduced to the idea that this is a laboratory planet. Life has been mixed, matched, manipulated, and seeded on this planet for literally maybe a couple of billion years, but certainly the last half billion. Uh, this is also, you'll hear this in Corey Good and David Wilcock talking about uh, the issue of this particular solar system having territorial, uh, ancient territorial claims. <clears throat> in fact, they go so far to say that <coughs> wherever you see a pyramid, <clears throat> wherever you see a pyramid, it is somebody's territorial claim in a war which is very interesting and for another presentation about what is actually, what, it, what is the archaeology in Antarctica and Arctic. So as Zoe pointed out star systems, he telepathically talked with Jerry in his head and showed him <coughs> symbols and images that humanoid DNA is from all over the universe. And all the way back then said to Jerry Wills, and it is beyond this dimension in other dimensions that the extraterrestrial Zoe telepath to Jerry Wills were like different frequencies of musical notes each dimension separate from others, but many dimensions together like a chord of music. Another teacher in Jerry's life was a Peruvian shaman named Pedro, who was familiar with the Lake Titicaca doorway of Abramamuru. Pedro did not speak English, but through an Aymara translator, Jerry learned from Pedro that the solid rock doorway was what the natives said was a two-way passage between worlds and dimensions. Pedro told Jerry to kneel down and place his forehead in a small, shallow, indented place on the rock, on this smaller door, and then to chant a specific tone over and over. After getting the tone just right, Pedro said the doorway will open and the chanter will disappear into other realms. Also, Pedro had seen what he called ancient ones come through that doorway. Those beings were very tall, like Jerry, six feet, nine inches or taller. And those ancient ones were dressed in regal garments similar to Inca royalty. Pedro also knew that the tall ancient ones would kneel in front of the doorway as he was teaching Jerry and that they would start singing or making humming sounds with their forehead against the rock door exactly where he had Jerry put his forehead and that those ancient ones would suddenly disappear. Listening to Pedro, Jerry wanted very much to see and find out for himself. And by November 1998, right after his marriage to Kathy, the couple traveled to Lake Titicaca in Peru. 
And at the Aramamuru doorway, Pedro taught Jerry how to make three different tones that were to always be kept secret. If Jerry could produce the tones correctly, he would go through that big rock doorway to where the ancient ones had come from. And Jerry described for me what happened on November 11th, 1998, at 11 p.m. in the night as he kneeled down before the rock doorway. Kathy was watching from a short distance away, and Jerry began to mimic the tones that Pedro had taught him. Suddenly, Jerry said it felt like he walked straight backwards off a cliff. Do that in your mind. You can almost feel your stomach spin. He feels like he walks backwards off a cliff. He has a sickening, falling feeling. And then he began to see stars and galaxies passing by as if he were in a protected bubble moving through the cosmos. And now we can hear Jerry himself describe what happened next. And then it felt as though I was moving through something. I could sense that there was an impedance there. I squeezed my eyes closed because it was just so much pressure. It was hard to breathe. And then suddenly, I find myself on this floor. I guess it's a floor. It was just a big white. Everything was white. You couldn't tell if there was a wall to the floor, to the ceiling, nothing. There wasn't any curvature. There wasn't any distinguishing aspect. Everything was equally luminous. It was just like in a big white cloud. Like I could stomp the floor and feel it in my foot. It felt like plastic. I decided to try to see if there were any acoustic properties. So I started whistling, high notes, low notes. It just was dead. So then I started hollering. You know, is anybody here? And it was just about second time that I hollered that there was this voice and it was like it was coming over an intercom. And it was a man. And he sounded a little surprised. So I asked him, where am I? And he says, who are you? And so I said, well, I'm Jerry Wills. Where are you from? And I said, well, I was at the doorway at Aramamuru. He says, I don't know what that is. I said, it's on the planet Earth in the Southern Hemisphere. And he says, oh, Earth, all right. I asked him what this place was. Where am I? Is this real? Am I really experiencing this? And he laughed, oh, it's very real. I understand your confusion. He said that I was on another world, that it was outside of my universe. So I wanted to understand how that's possible. And he says, well, there are many universes and you have just passed from yours into ours. All right, so where is this universe? He said, it wouldn't do me any good to even try to explain it to you. I asked him how I'd gotten there. Well, apparently, these folks, whoever they are, had been very curious about the nature of the universe. In order to understand their universe, they tried to recreate using what they knew to recreate a model of the universe. But what had happened is that when they had recreated this, their creation had started to evolve. It had evolved up to a point to where it stopped growing. It was quite large. And that they had created another universe inadvertently. They weren't planning on doing this. And it had evolved, and it evolved quite rapidly. And I said, well, I don't understand this because we think the universe is billions and billions of years old. He says, well, where you are, you measure time much differently. Time is different in every universe. We've watched for the past, and he was struggling with terms that didn't make any sense to me. For him, it had been, let's say, a few decades. But within that universe that I had just come from, it was billions of years. Time was remarkably different for me than it was for him. He says, all right, you see that in the distance. 
probably 100 feet from me. He says, just walk towards that. It was this large, black, gelatinous-looking thing just floating in the air. You could see all these pinpoints of light. It was peppered with light and dark areas. And I said, what is this? And he said, that's the universe you came from. Well, this thing, it had these rods that were luminous, like neon. There was little beads of light moving through them, kind of like a fluorescent bulb, you know, overhead fluorescent that gets bad. It has like little dark areas moving through it. I'm holding in my hand the illustration that you emailed to me. You are the figure in the foreground. Right, about 100 feet away from that thing. Did you get communication from the male voice about what the rods are doing with this gelatinous cosmic mass? Well, the rods were around its perimeter. Didn't even look like they were connected to anything. I said, these light rods, what's that? And he says, well, that holds it in place. It maintains the balance. And we think that's the reason why it stopped evolving. So did they deliberately try to stop the evolution of this universe? I think so. And when he was telling me about this, they were really very afraid that it was going to continue growing and it would just overwhelm them and then what would happen to them. So they're in another universe and they created in this other universe a laboratory universe to test or learn something. And then their laboratory test universe took off somehow and created the universe that you and I and everything in our universe is? He had told me that they were trying to understand their place within their universe. And that what they had discovered is that they were inside of someone else's universe, just like we were inside of theirs. He says it's just layers and layers. There's very little that separates one from the other. And that's what they had learned. This 13.9 billion light year universe from our point of view is inside of the voice in the all white room universe and that universe is in another universe. It's like you're describing those Russian dolls that all fit inside of each other. It's just like Russian dolls. I said, what kind of machine would you use to do this? He tried to explain it. The closest thing that I can explain was what we call the Large Hadron Collider, a big thing over in Europe. This voice he was talking about how they were colliding particles. And somehow a spark had occurred, and the spark didn't go away. Instead, it started growing. And as it grew, it started accumulating and creating more of itself on its own. He says, think of it maybe as a white hole. Think of it as a place where all of creation manifests itself within these torrents of energy that are moving both inward and outward simultaneously. If they were trying to experiment in a lab in another universe, trying to create the conditions in which universes come into being and evolve to settle something that they were trying to explore, then they would have to have set up conditions that would have set the rules in whatever universe they were trying to create to test. And it might explain why this universe is like on the edge of a razor blade in terms of the conditions that favor life as opposed to no life. They had learned that life had started to populate throughout that universe. They had made. Yeah, they were fascinated by this, curious as can be how this was possible. And this doorway that I had gone through was something that they had put in place. They had these doorways throughout our universe in various places. They had been sending scientists in there to study the universe because this was a whole new realm of science for them to explore. And when they started discovering life in there, well, they were pretty shocked. Apparently, I'm not the only person who'd ever come through that doorway. And apparently, these doorways go to other places on this planet as well as to other planets. So maybe these folks that were coming through had figured out how to direct their travels. According to this voice I was talking to, there is a way to direct 
where you're going, but my only concern at that point was how do I get back? Okay, is it possible that the beings that Pedro was referring to as a shaman would be the intelligence in this other universe in which we are nested? The other universe would come through to test their laboratory experiment, creating this universe that surprised them because it was evolving with life in it. Anything that was seen emerging from that doorway that you went through would be from the experimenters in the other universe that encompasses us. I think that that's very possible because, as I mentioned, time is much different there than it is here, and they might have been through and thinking that the Inca or whoever would have succeeded them were dressed in a certain way the last time they were through, so the next time they go through, they dress like that. They're royalty. They can walk around wherever they want to go, and no one's going to give them any grief. But they're not royalty. They're actually scientists from another universe. Yeah, exactly. That voice that I was talking to was telling me that part of their interest was that when they looked outward, things just expanded out and out and out, but there were things that were identical out there as there were deeper and deeper they looked into the smallest things, that it was always the same. It's the same if it was an atom versus a galaxy. They were trying to understand their place in the universe. What they didn't expect was to find that there was a universe that they were within and that there was a universe that they surrounded. It was quite an astonishing thing to have discovered for them. If they discovered that they were inside of another universe and that they had made a universe that they surrounded, then maybe even an infinite number of universes nest within each other. I think that's what the implication is. That there isn't an upper or lower limit. And what is the relationship now between their universe and this one? Oh, I haven't a clue. I could not understand his definition of time. The only thing that I can figure is that the means of moving from one point to another was outside the dynamic of time altogether. That these doorways are instantaneous passageways to other places. You know, you can be somewhere for a while, go back through it, and arrive just shortly after you left. Which is saying that there is time travel through these doorways that the other universe created in order to study this universe. When it comes to moving through these things, I don't know how time works. You know, it was the same situation when I was talking with Zoe. He was telling me that they could go from where they are to here and that it would be almost instantaneous. There really wasn't any time during the time of travel. Time stopped and then it restarted once you arrived. What are you left with now, the end of 2016, as a residue of that idea that we are in a simulated universe created by someone else? What it's left me with is a sense of awe. The thing that I find to be most remarkable is that at least between this universe and that one, there are beings who are aware of themselves and aware of their surroundings. But it is that spark of life that joins us, no matter what universe we're in. I know there's life out there among those stars. Somehow there's a veil. Somehow there's this barrier, this thing that I passed through twice. So this commonality of life, I find that to be awe-inspiring. No matter where you go, there's a spark of intelligence and a spark of life out there. And it can be quite good.